CPH student colloquium. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Timothy Jones, who did his uh, undergraduate degree uh, here at Penn in uh, BE, uh, and he decided to stick around to to uh, pursue his uh, PhD. So he's he's been here um, uh, doing research in uh, micro uh, uh, atomic microscopy and uh, materials, and so he's going to uh, talk about some of his uh, research. Um, during his graduate studies. So without further ado, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, so microwave impedance microscopy of inhomogeneous and nanostructured materials. Um, the outline of the talk, I'm just going to introduce scanning probe microscopy for anyone out there who may be unfamiliar. Uh, use that to kind of introduce the, the technique mentioned in the title, talk about the materials that I'll be using, uh, then go over some of the basics of the technique and uh, you know, how and why I'll be doing what I'll be doing. Uh, then discuss some of the preliminary experimental results I have, as well as uh, more, so more specifically my efforts to model and interpret those results. So scanning probe microscopy um, is a little bit different than ordinary optical microscopy, where you think of light that's being reflected onto a sample or transmitted, uh, and you're just collecting all that in parallel and generating an image all at once. Um, in scanning probe microscopy, you have a very sharp tip that has a radius of curvature of maybe tens of nanometers. Um, and you're scanning that tip across the surface of a sample point by point and collecting samples of the topography. And you sample the topography just by um, uh, reading the deflection of a laser spot that's collected in a gridded photo detector. So that generates a sequential image. Um, but that's not all we can do with it. There's actually quite a bit more information we can gather in this environment. Uh, we're actually measuring the interaction between the tip and the sample here. And that can be mediated and governed by all sorts of different forces. Um, you can have electrostatic forces or magnetic forces, chemical forces, Van der Waals forces. Uh, you can test hardness on a nanometer scale. Um, you can introduce, uh, you, can int you can add, a, uh, put the whole system in like a heated environment or a cryogenic environment. You can do this in fluid. Um, so it's really a very versatile technique, uh, your general class of techniques, uh, where you can investigate all sorts of interesting nanoscale physics. Um, so one of the things we can do is couple electromagnetic signals to the tip. Um, you can think, in just kind of the simplest case, you could get uh, you know, nanometer resolution DC IV characteristics with the probe. You can do more advanced things like uh, uh, adding in optical signals or higher frequency signals. So for instance, uh, there's a tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, in, in Raman spectroscopy, you're using an excitation laser to drive a uh, surface plasma on resonance in your sample. Um, but in the ordinary methodology, uh, you have a diffraction-limited laser spot on your sample. Uh, but with the addition of a scanning tip like this, and maybe a, a nanoparticle at the end of the tip, uh, you can in greatly enhance the, the local field intensity uh, at the tip and basically improve the contrast in your measured spectra by several orders of magnitude. So it's very useful there. Uh, likewise, in uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, which is something you may have heard of, uh, we're scanning a tip over a sample again, but this time maintaining a short distance between the tip and the sample. Uh, we're placing a bias on the sample as well. So across that, uh, that small distance, we're collecting um, tunneling current uh, as the probe scans from point to point. So in that case, you can actually achieve atomic scale resolution and, and generate images of individual atoms. Um, so then moving on to uh, the techni technique mentioned in the title, which is, again, kind of a pairing of scanning probe microscopy and electromagnetics. Uh, in this case, I'm pairing a 3 gigahertz electrical signal to the tip uh, via an impedance matching network. So I'm actually driving electrical resonance in the tip. Uh, and then as I scan across, I'm measuring uh, the amount of reflected wave, or the, the reflected portion of the wave that comes back uh, from the sample. And the reflected part of the wave uh, basically is determined by, or is influenced by the, uh, 
electrical properties uh, within a small volume underneath the tip. So what that means is that we could actually image, uh, we could image samples, um, we could image their electrical inhomogeneity um, as it varies within the depth of the sample rather than just on the surface. So uh, we could detect features that might not necessarily have uh, any visibility just from a top topographical scan on the surface. Uh, the reflected part of the wave is reported to me uh, in terms of a change in a tip sample admittance. So the admittance between the tip and the sample. Um, it is just a change. So that means at the moment this is a contrast only technique. Um, but that doesn't necessarily limit its, use, uh, its, its usefulness. Um, for instance, it's been used, I mean, it's, there are already several publications out there. It's only been around for a few years. But uh, just a simple example, it's particularly well suited, uh, measurement of carbon nanotubes according to their electrical properties. So carbon nanotubes have somewhat different structures. Uh, they have differing chiralities, which is just kind of referring to the the uh, orientation of atoms within the tube, uh, just that different structure can actually change the electrical properties drastically. So uh, depending on chirality, you can see either semiconducting or totally metallic nanotubes. Um, and discerning between the two can be maybe somewhat elusive uh, just because there's no, there's no change in mass or chemical composition or anything like that. But uh, with this scanning technique where we're measuring conductivity uh, point by point along with the topography, we can image these individual nanotubes like in A and B region. But uh, in the A region, we see a very low conductivity. In the B region, we see uh, a higher conductivity. So we've actually kind of, uh, in, in this study, they've, they've been able to differentiate very easily between the two, uh, the two types of nanotubes here. Uh, another example is um, imaging of ferroelectric or ferromagnetic materials. Um, so it's been theorized that uh, for ferroelectrics or ferromagnetics, uh, where you have regions of mutually aligned magnetic dipoles, uh, it's been theorized that the interfaces between those regions can have very unique electrical properties like uh, a, a, an increase in, in electrical conductivity. Um, and again, it's, it's very easily, it's rarely observed with this technique, uh, even though there's no change in the topography. These white curvilinear features represent those uh, high conductivity uh, interfaces between the domains, the domain walls. Uh, so there's quite a lot actually already out there. These are just, these are just two examples. Um, but, but what am I going to do with it? Uh, so I had said that it's a contrast technique, and actually all these past studies are kind of qualitative in nature. I'm um, interested in exploring uh, quantitative analysis with this technique, and more specifically trying to correlate um, the, the structure of heterogeneous materials uh, with their electrical function, their, their electrical behavior. Um, so in order to do something like that, uh, we kind of have to be careful of our uh, uh, careful with our choice of material. Um, we'd like some set of materials that could sample that that space of different electrical behavior and different structure uh, uh, with with a lot of precision, like engineerability in these materials. We get to pick exactly where we are in that space, uh, while maybe everything else kind of remains constant. So we're only turning the knobs that we're interested in. Um, so just with that general idea, probably the obvious choice, I think, is carbon materials. Um, There's so many different allotropes out there. I mean, you may have some vague familiarity with them, but you know, carbon nanotubes, graphene, lucky balls, and all that. Um, they provide a whole host of different structures and uh, electrical properties. But I'm actually zeroing in on a couple here, um, carbide-derived carbon and these onion-like carbons. Um, Carbide-derived carbon uh, starts with a carbide. Uh, you remove the metal atoms. So you're left with this chaotic uh, network of porous carbon. And what's interesting, though, is that with your choice of just synthesis conditions, just uh, chemistry, basically, uh, you can tune the structure of the material with surprising accuracy, uh, actually sub-angstrom accuracy in the pore size distribution. 
uh, and you can alter the porosity and the force structure, uh, as well as its electrical conductivity. So just with the choice of synthesis conditions, I have the ability to kind of sample that space I was interested in. Um, likewise, with this onion-like carbon, so-called, because it's composed of these concentric fullerene-like spheres, um, it, it starts from a, uh, a nanodiamond precursor, and uh, as you uh, anneal that precursor, you're you're introducing uh, different levels of graphitization, so you're inducing that, that uh, fullerene-like structure and changing the, electro, uh, the electrical conductivity. Um, so these materials can, and, any, and actually just, just visibly here, there's a, there's a difference in structure. Uh, there's an endohedral structure here and kind of an exohedral structure that gives me an additional, uh, additional space to sample. Um, so... Before I move to kind of uh, trying to understand um, how the field interacts with the inhomogeneity in these samples, uh, we need to go back to the technique and discuss just some of the underlying physics. Um, so this scanning, this uh, microwave impedance microscopy represents uh, a, uh, an instance of near-field microscopy. Um, in near-field microscopy, or if, uh, from any, uh, away from any electromagnetic source, you usually define the space uh, in terms of a near field and a far field. Um, so ordinary optical microscopy exists in the far field because there's usually, uh, the, the mathematics of dealing with the fields is a little bit easier. Uh, however, you're actually limited by what's called the diffraction limit. So that puts a lower bound on the uh, the spatial separation between features that are resolvable. So if, you had, if we had two features, adjacent features, um, if they're any closer than about half a wavelength apart, you can't distinguish between the two. So maybe in terms of biology, you'd be able to see uh, you know, cells and a little bit inside the cell, but you wouldn't be able to get detailed structural information about uh, the organelles or viruses or things like that. Um, Really, the only way to achieve true sub-wavelength sub imaging uh, is by placing the sample uh, so close to the detector or the uh, the source that you're no longer discarding the information that's in these short-range, exponentially decaying, uh, evanescent waves. There are different ways to kind of circumvent the uh, the diffraction limit, but this is really the only way to do it uh, fundamentally. Um, you can also use, uh, interestingly. Uh, uh, negative index of refraction meta materials to focus those short range waves, but uh, that's that's not part of my work. Um, so if you're if you have a near field microscope, if everything is within the near field, um, that kind of changes the setup of your microscope a little bit. Um, the first the first proposal for a near field microscope came from this man Singe in 1928. Uh, he envisioned some illumination being focused onto a small particle. The uh, particle tends to scatter the field through the sample. Uh, the transmitted radiation is collected by a microscope objective here. Uh, he sent this sketch to Einstein. Einstein thought it, was, uh, it would work in principle, but would not be practically realizable. Uh, and that was indeed the case, just based on the, technological, uh, the, the, the fabrication technology at the time. Uh, basically, there was no near-field microwave or uh, field microscope until uh, 1972 in the microwave regime and 84 in the optical regime. Um, so that kind of uh, introduces the question actually of, so for the technique in the title, why am I using microwaves uh, as opposed to optical frequencies or maybe lower frequencies? Um, what's special about microwaves? Uh, well, in terms of sample preparation, you don't even have to ground the sample actually, but uh, which you do have to do for, for lower frequency techniques. Um, but uh, the real difference is from, uh, from the optical frequency regime where, um, where uh, the uh, quantum interactions tend to govern the response of the material, which kind of uh, maybe hampers the analysis unnecessarily if we're just investigating uh, uh, epsilon, the uh, permittivity and the conductivity sigma. Uh, so furthermore, we actually get uh, better 
uh, uh, better contrast in those electrical properties of the microwave range than we do in the optical range. So for, uh, so for materials, you generally def uh, divide the, uh, the permittivity, which is part of what we're measuring, uh, into a real and imaginary part, where the imaginary part uh, represents the losses in the system. So for the dielectrics, we discard the losses. Um, so for uh, you know, a well-known dielectric like silicon oxide, the uh, permittivity is about 4. And then for conductors, we can't discard the, uh, the imaginary part. And actually, at uh, gigahertz frequencies, it's the imaginary part that kind of uh, uh, dominates this. And so at 3 gigahertz for aluminum, we see 10 to the 7 versus 4. That's quite a contrast. But given the uh, uh, inverse dependence on the angular frequency there, omega, if we moved from, say, 10 to the 9 hertz to 10 to the 14 hertz, which corresponds to the optical range, uh, we'd actually be losing about five orders of magnitude there. So for the parameters that we're interested in, uh, microwaves are probably better here. Um, so assuming then we are happy with the microwave regime, uh, how then are we going to model the interaction of that microwave field with the, uh, the inhomogeneity in the sample? It's actually a longstanding uh, problem. Um, kind of one of the conventional approaches to dealing with that problem is just uh, through a process of averaging, of homo uh, homogenization. So is there, a, uh, is there a model homogeneous material that I can use to predict the behavior of my uh, heterogeneous material uh, in response to some applied field? Uh, that type of analysis has led to simple formulas like this well-known Maxwell-Garnet formula, which relates uh, an effective permittivity uh, to constituent permittivities for a composite material, in this case for spherical inclusions inside uh, a background material. Uh, and this eta here is just the volume fraction of the inclusions with respect to the host. Um, and also the, this well-known Brueggemann formula, more notably symmetric. Uh, it doesn't actually care which, which material is which, which one is the host and which one is the inclusion. Um, so yeah, there's this, there's this method of homogenization and averaging uh, to model your, your material. But um, it's also kind of important to highlight maybe another route of analysis um, wherein you don't want to discard the individual, you know, you don't want to discard all the complexity that's in the sample. Um, maybe you want to actually fully reconstruct the, uh, the structure uh, based on just its, its response to an applied field. This is exactly what happens in MRI and uh, CAT scans. It's called tomography. So, you know, I hope that the material inside my brain can't just be substituted with an average quantity. Um, I actually want to, uh, you know, learn what the complete structure is there. Um, so that sort of scan happens in the far field. Uh, so it, it, you can actually do it in the near field as well. Um, it's a little bit more diffi uh, difficult mathematically, uh, but it has been recently demonstrated. Um, so if you consider maybe point scatterers that exist uh, with different orientations uh, at different depths inside of a sample, uh, these authors were able to solve the inverse scattering problem. Uh, so they, they were able to collect basically the scattered field and figure out where those point scatterers were. Again, this is just a simulation, but you see uh, you see uh, they basically resolve the, uh, the placement of the point scatters uh, with uh, lowering uh, resolution as you increase in depth. Uh, so this, this type of analysis actually requires, like, it requires a lot of additional information. Um, you need to do multiple scans. You need to have uh, um, uh, illumination from, uh, from different angles. Um, it's really just quite a bit more information than the instrument that I'm using can readily provide to me right now. So if I'm going to go the other route, uh, I do still need some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, way to characterize the instrument and make sure that it is telling me what I think it's telling me. It's telling me the, uh, you know, the, the, electrical, the, the conductivity and the permittivity. Uh, so if the instrument just gives me these two uh, orthogonal outputs, uh, I just want to make sure then that they do align with the real and imaginary part of the tip sample admittance and that it's not actually providing like a, uh, 
a, uh, a linear combination maybe of the real and imaginary parts. So in order to do that, to calibrate the instrument, um, I just scan over uh, purely capacitive structure. And as the tip moves either from the substrate or to this capacitive stack here, uh, I'm basically switching between two output vectors. And I have the ability to uh, just adjust the phase angle on the, that output axis to make sure I only see contrast in the, uh, in the imaginary channel for this capacitive structure, you no know, contrast in the real channel. Um, so the result of that type of uh, calibration is just, or actually any experiment, is basically an image like this. Um, I'm just showing the imaginary part here. Uh, the z-axis here is the topography. Um, so I'm, I'm detecting one of these uh, dots here. I'm scanning over one of the dots. Uh, I just see this, just this extruded profile and not actually a circle because I'm just scanning over this line uh, uh, until I'm satisfied with the phase angle. And there's a corresponding real part image that would just show no color contrast. Um, so with this calibrated instrument, I've actually already sampled a whole lot of those materials that I mentioned. Um, all sort of different carbon materials that basically span uh, that entire range of, uh, of synthesis conditions wherein the structure and the uh, uh, conductivity tend to vary, so the relevant range um, uh, for both of the, the carbide derived carbon and the onion like carbon from different precursors um, uh, and, and different sorts of additives. Uh, this is just a picture of the setup. Um, but in order to be able to say anything about those materials and, and try to uh, uh, maybe understand how the field interacts with them, um, basically just interpret the results, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on some, like a collection of models. Um, so just starting simple, we have uh, just an ordinary finite element simulation. Uh, for just basic electrostatics, uh, or ba the basic electrical behavior between the tip and the sample for just a, a homogeneous sample. Uh, so this is a kind of a quasi 3D simulation. Um, I have uh, just an axis of symmetry here. I'm just solving one slice because there's some rotational symmetry in the system. But uh, I have my tip uh, in contact with the sample. I apply some uh, harmonic 3 gigahertz electrical signal to the top of the tip and uh, ground the, uh, the back of the sample. And I said you didn't have to ground, but that's, I'm just doing that because I'm using a uh, quasi-static approximation here. Uh, I don't need to do a full wave simulation, basically because uh, the, uh, the relevant depth uh, that I'm considering here is just, uh, it's, it's much, much smaller than the free space wavelength uh, at 3 gigahertz, which is about 10 centimeters. So that puts me in, I, I can use this quasi-static approximation. Um, and the results are the voltage field everywhere, uh, and then also, more importantly, the, uh, uh, the tip sample admittance, and as I scan the, uh, or as I sweep the conductivity of the sample here uh, between these values. So the results of that, uh, just the real and imaginary parts over sigma, um, just an increasing real part and kind of switching between these two capacitive, uh, these two levels for the capacitive part. Um, this behavior can be easily understood just from uh, an ordinary, ordinary equivalent circuit. Uh, basically, in the low and high conductivity limits, I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of changing the balance between these capacitors. Um, and you can model also additionally the real, the real part here. Uh, with just a, uh, a fixed parameter times the conductivity sigma to get a total conductance. Uh, and you can figure out, you can see where that parameter comes from just by considering the voltage distribution underneath the tip. Uh, the equipotential lines here, which are perpendicular to the direction of current flow, uh, are roughly hemispherical. Uh, so if you were to just write out the conductance for a hemispherically shaped conductor like this here, uh, you, you can see where the, that K just kind of pops out. It's just dependent on the dimensions. Um, so if we fit the <laughs> response to that equivalent circuit, if it's quite well, it's a good model. Uh, large nines there for R squared. Um, so if that provides us with some means of 
of understanding just uh, you know the basics of what's happening underneath the tip. Uh, we do need additionally some uh, some way of mapping the output of the instrument, which is actually just in it's it's actually just the output of an amplifier. It's just in volts. Uh, we do know that the, the voltage levels correspond to differing uh, conductivities or permittivities, but uh, we don't actually have any reference there. We just know maybe one region is more or less conductive than another. Uh, so we just have voltages here. How then do we relate those to maybe absolute values of admittance uh, in these simulations, these finite element simulations, where I can actually sample uh, the entire space of, of uh, sigma and epsilon or the, you know, the relevant space uh, and generate these functions for um, uh, the real and imaginary tip sample admittances. So what's our bridge there? Uh, well, if you just zero in on, on this part for a moment, um, if, if we know that the, uh, the instrument is giving us something in terms of, uh, is, that is corresponding to admittance, but we just don't know exactly where the reference point is, I mean, if we pretend that the output of that amplifier is, is varying between these, uh, these values of voltage uh, and assume a nice linear characteristic for the output amplifier, then that's going to get mapped into some, uh, some range of admittances here, which maybe we could, uh, we could place a reference on just by testing samples that have well-characterized uh, uh, you know, bulk properties for conductivity and permittivity. Um, and then from there, from our simulations where we've sampled these spaces entirely, uh, we could map that range onto sigma uh, or also epsilon. Um, so if you generalize this picture for the, both the real and the imaginary parts, uh, you, I, I tend to draw pictures like this where, um, so in this case, the dark red lines represent the, uh, the, amp the limits of the amplifier. Uh, for the real part, blue lines for the limits for the imaginary part. Um, and uh, if I were measuring some initial, uh, some initial value of admittance corresponding to some contour on this surface, uh, and also an initial value for the uh, imaginary part of the admittance, then I know I'm sitting right here in, in sigma and epsilon space. And as I transition to different values, I can, I can, uh, I can read off basically values for epsilon and sigma uh, based on the simulations that I've generated. Uh, so the, okay, so that provides us then with some, uh, some mapping, maybe some, some means of mapping the output of the instrument to admittance and then back to uh, conductivity and permittivity. Um, we might then move on to how are we going to model uh, some of the uh, some of the complexity in the sample where we're not actually just dealing with uh, a homogeneous sample. Um, so kind of analogous to uh, some of those averaging homogenization procedures uh, and those effective medium theories, um, we can use uh, these random resistor networks um, which kind of attempt to model some of the maybe just uh, a two-phase or multi-phase composite uh, based on the, uh, the values of individual resistors in the network. So there's actually a procedure to uh, kind of generate a uniform lattice that corresponds to a random lattice. Uh, that procedure basically consists of, if, if you start with this picture where each, each bond uh, has a constant value, then you'd see a constant drop over, the, over individual columns, right? A constant voltage drop over columns. Unless you were to maybe just change one of the values in the middle there, um, you'd be changing some, uh, you'd be changing the voltage drop across the middle. And if you were to maybe vary the, uh, the value of, of conductance there according to the distribution of resistors here, so the, the distribution of, or of conductances here, force the change to zero, then you've effectively ensured that your, uh, your output lattice or your, your uniform lattice has the same current carrying properties as the random lattice. So we have this, uh, this uh, uniform lattice that can model this. It provides basically the same uh, current carrying behavior as the random lattice. Uh, and so if we just had uh, a simple case where maybe we just had two, two different conductances, just one and zero, so we're picking, yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, we just had uh, uh, two different uh, conductances 
uh, 1 and 0, so just a, a, either a bond or not, where we're choosing with probability p. Uh, we can arrive at nice little formulas like this. Uh, so to, it, as a means to calculate the uh, effective bond conductance. Uh, so just comparing the results from these two pictures, if we generate, uh, we generate random lattices uh, that uh, are for different uh, uh, bond probabilities, um, and then compare with uh, the results of that integral. Um, there's a nice, uh, very nice agreement. Uh, notably, there's a small deviation here uh, and actually a, uh, a flattening to zero conductance for uh, low bond densities. Uh, that's called the percolation threshold. Basically, as, you're, uh, as I, uh, if I take out so many resistors, basically that there's just almost no chance that uh, I'm going to see a conducting path between, uh, you know, the the nodes here and the grounded nodes on the bottom here. Uh, percolation percolation on networks, I think, is probably something that maybe anyone else out there in, in network science is, is maybe familiar with. It's actually relevant to a whole lot of different problems. Um, but so so I have this one tool now to. Uh, to uh, model some of the inhomogeneity in the sample. Uh, I can also go back then to, uh, or sorry, the, uh, there is one, actually one issue. Uh, this is a cubic lattice, and I said before that the, the shape of the field inside the sample is roughly hemispherical, so this picture does not match you know, this picture, this uh, hemispherical picture. Uh, it's, there's just a, a simple, uh, a mathematical transformation you can do. Just uh, embed your lattice IJK coordinates inside a real Cartesian space um, and uh, then apply just a, a, a coordinate transform. So you can kind of push this picture inside that one. And uh, basically what you end up with is a lattice that still has the same, uh, it, it matches the, the conductivity that, uh, or the conductance that you'd see for a continuum model here. Uh, and also we still retain some sensitivity to uh, uh, to removing individual resistors here um, just because of their lower density. Um, so uh, we, there's, a, there's a, uh, an equivalence here between the, uh, the, finite, the continuum model and the uh, network model. Um, so it, actually, if we, if we introduce then some, if we start uh, taking out these bonds at random, um, we can look at the, uh, and, and generating an equivalent continuum model so we have a composite uh, or a random resistor network and a corresponding uh, continuum model. Uh, again, do the same comparison with the analytic theory. Um, there's actually a small deviation here just because we're taking out chunks in this case. We're not truly sampling just individual bonds and flipping a coin, right? Uh, we, we're kind of changing the, the sampling. Um, but there's still a reasonably good behavior here, so uh, I have some kind of equivalence between uh, uh, these models. Uh, so I could use the random resistor network uh, to maybe uh, uh, avoid maybe higher computation time for uh, a full uh, uh, continuum model. So from here I have basically uh, models for uh, mapping the output of the instrument to admittance and to electrical properties. I also have some model for uh, mapping the, uh, or understanding how com uh, the inhomogeneity in the material gives rise to uh, different uh, uh, electrical properties. Uh, I don't actually have any results from the uh, from those models yet. I had to go back and do an additional run of experiments to fill in some gaps to be able to compare the the, uh, the models with the experiments, all those samples that I had listed. Uh, uh, so I can't yet say whether or not uh, the models will be uh, you know shed any light on the re on the results. But uh, even beyond that. Uh, we can imagine doing, um, I might like to uh, vary the frequency, the applied frequency. As I said, I was kind of fixed into 3 gigahertz. Uh, it's just uh, the instrument is designed for that. And it, uh, you just have to manufacture a different impedance matching element to get a different frequency. So it's, it's definitely doable, but just a little bit of extra work. Um, I also might like to uh, modulate the uh, tip sample admittance or the, the tip sample distance, maybe to get closer to uh, uh, doing like a, 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 a some kind of tomographic type analysis. Um, so those are kind of maybe what's on the horizon for me. Um, but otherwise, in general, just to summarize, 
you know, I have this technique that, uh, that measures the uh, admittance. It measures uh, really, really uh, uh, high spatial resolution response to an electric field. Uh, and I'm hoping to characterize uh, uh, the structure and the uh, electrical function of all these materials. Uh, so just, I guess, thanks to these, these people and institutions, my advisor, uh, Dr. Santiago. Uh, so with that, if there are any questions. Yes. Is this something that uh, is done in the new building, or do you have the tool over here? Um, it's done in the new building. It's done in the basement. The, uh, the NBIC has a large scanning probe facility. Yeah. Um, that's where I do the work, where I do the experimental work. So I've been, I work with magnets, um, in particular I'm trying to look at the, uh, the nanostructure of the magnets after I do them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious if this method would be able to show that. Um, I don't think it's particularly sensitive to uh, magnetic, uh, anything like magnetic fields, really. But if you have some kind of phenomenon, like I mentioned with the example for the domain walls, if if maybe your magnetic uh, material is, is giving rise to like different electrical behavior, I, I see it being sensitive to that, but maybe without knowing more about your system, uh, I can't really say. Yeah. 